Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Dobeck. I'm a clinical dietitian at the Jefferson Weinberg ALS Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As a dietitian or student, you may come across patients that are on enteral nutrition formulas. Some might tolerate those formulas great. Others might have symptoms such as GI intolerance. If you talk to the provider, they're often going to blame the enteral nutrition on the GI intolerances. Maybe it's Usually it's not. So we're going to talk about that today and three ways on how to address the common complications that are associated with enteral nutrition, including diarrhea, constipation, and nausea and vomiting. I will say that this is for relatively normal GI tract, so we're not going to be talking about short bowel syndrome or bariatric surgery, pancreatitis, that sort of thing, just because those are much more complex and those could be videos in and of themselves. So the three things I'm going to focus on today is diarrhea, constipation, and nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So starting with diarrhea, first we want to define what diarrhea is. And diarrhea is typically defined as three or more watery stools per day. I'm going to review some potential culprits, but I know many providers want to blame the diarrhea on enteral nutrition, but as we're going to talk about, that's not typically the case. So the biggest culprit is usually medications. So we want to review the medications. Has the patient been on any antibiotics recently? Do they have any sugar alcohol containing medications? So these are typically your elixirs that might contain sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, erythritol, those sort of things. Is a patient on oral or enteral magnesium? So I'm not talking about IV magnesium, but magnesium when it's in the oral or enteral form can cause loose stools. Is the patient on any medications that are meant to induce diarrhea for medicinal purposes? So lactulose for high ammonia levels, KX late for high potassium levels. Does the patient have a bowel regimen ordered? And let's say the nurse has been swamped. They haven't looked back at how many stools the patient has been having. Maybe they've been having some loose stools or diarrhea. And the, the laxative, the stool softener, pops up on the medication administration record, and the nurse goes ahead and gives it. Sometimes that happens as well. After medications, we want to rule out infection. So is there any chance that the patient might have C. diff or a foodborne illness or viral gastroenteritis? Next, we want to look at significant stool burden as a potential culprit of diarrhea. So let's say the patient hasn't had a bowel movement in three or four or five plus days. That stool gets really compact in the intestines. And the only thing that is going to go around it is liquid. So it's what we call overflow diarrhea. Does the patient have a history of diarrhea? So maybe they have a history of something like irritable bowel syndrome in which they fluctuate between constipation and diarrhea. And uh, sadly, this is quite normal for them. Less common, but still potential culprit is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So if you think that's a possibility, we want to rule that out as well. I do want to address a formula dogma. So back in the day that people used to think that these hypertonic or high osmolality enteral nutrition formulas might be the cause of diarrhea just because they might be drawing in water into the intestines. But there have been a couple of studies that show that hypertonic formulas do not lead to diarrhea. So the solution for diarrhea, after we review the medications, we rule out any sort of infectious etiology or impaction or constipation as being the cause of diarrhea, we first want to see if the enteral nutrition formula contains fiber, particularly soluble, soluble fiber, because this supports the health of colonocytes. So adding fiber may just be masking the underlying cause of diarrhea, but I do think it is a good option worth trying. We then want to try anti-diarrheal medications. That might be helpful. Then we may try a different formula, such as a semi-elemental formula, which I'm going to go into later, especially if we think malabsorption might be the cause of the diarrhea, given the patient's history or whatever is going on with them right now. I don't think we're there yet for probiotics. Um, we haven't really defined which probiotic or which dose might be helpful, um, but I think this is an area of research that we need to keep our eyes on in the next few years. Next, we're gonna be talking about constipation. And again, we first want to define it. Constipation is typically um, defined as a bowel movement of every three days or less. If the patient's having hard stool, if they're straining to have a bowel movement, they're having any sort of abdominal pain um, because of constipation. Those are all signs. 
and the goal is to prevent constipation. But let's say that didn't happen and your patient is constipated. Again, first, we want to look at medications as being a possible cause. And so we're going to look, is the patient on any sort of narcotics or opioids? Are they on any sort of PO or enteral iron supplements? Then we want to consider mobility. So we know that some patients are immobile, particularly in the hospital. Um, if we can increase the activity, we want to. So thinking about getting a physical therapist consult, encouraging the patient to get out of bed, out walking the halls. If they are at home and live a sedentary lifestyle, can we get them to have more activity in their lives? Next, again, we want to rule out blockage or impaction of the bowels. So consider doing an abdominal x-ray to rule out those. And then we want to address fiber and hydration. So we want to consider increasing fiber or increasing our free water flushes. We know that um, some patients have chronic immobility like spinal cord injury and are very apt to get constipated. In those populations, we wanna um, really be careful about fiber. So if they're on a higher fiber and real nutrition formula, getting, even though it's a recommended 25 to 35 grams per day, that might be too much for them. And we wanna actually consider lowering the fiber re regimen for them. Um, while also making sure they get adequate hydration and a bowel regimen. And then we want to consider starting or increasing the bowel regimen. So the stool softeners, the laxatives, if the patient needs a suppository or enema, so working with your provider to get those ordered. Now we're going to talk about nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramping. So again, we want to rule out any sort of underlying medications or conditions. So is a patient going through chemotherapy that might cause a nausea? Do they have a history of gastroparesis or GERD or peptic ulcers? Do they have constipation? Because if nothing's coming out the bottom end, it has nowhere else to go. So it tends to come up the top end with some nausea and vomiting. Is a patient taking medications on an empty stomach? I know me personally, I get very nauseous if I have meds on an empty stomach. So if the patient doesn't have to be MPO around the medication administration time period, can we um, work with the physician or the provider to make sure that they're not getting meds on an empty stomach? Next, again, we wanna rule out any sort of infection that might cause nausea, vomiting, or abdominal cramping, such as foodborne illnesses, the viral gastroenteritis. This is more common in the home setting, but it can happen at any facilities that is the formula expired? Is it spoiled? So especially for our home patients, they're getting the enteral nutrition formula delivered to them on a monthly basis. So some of them just don't have the storage in their house. They'll leave it in their garage and that garage might get really cold or really hot and the formula might spoil over time. Is the formula contaminated? So um, they didn't use good hand washing techniques. Then we wanna talk about the temperature of both the formula and water. So for me and you, when we drink ice cold water, it goes into our mouth, down our esophagus, it gets all warmed up. So by the time it hits our stomach, it's pretty warm. For if you're bypassing that through like an NG tube or a G tube, that is hard to take cold liquids into a warm stomach. And that might cause some nausea, it might cause some cramping. So we wanna make sure that these uh, formulas and waters are at room temperature. I know in the home sitting, if they're getting bolus two fees, they might do say one and a half containers of bolus at a time. They're putting that other half in their fridge for when they use it next administration. We just wanna encourage those patients to put that container out on the counter for 10 minutes, let it warm up or put it in a bowl of warm water to warm it up. Then maybe the patient's having nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping because the formula is being administered too rapidly. So this is especially the case if the patient's getting bolus tube feeds. It might just be too fast for them, especially if we have these malnourished people that have just been eating bites of food for the past days or weeks or even months. Their stomach inside has really shrunk down and it needs some time to expand. So they might have to go to longer administration periods like gravity feeds or pump administered feeds. And then lastly, maybe they're just intolerant to the formula. This is, from my experience, more rare. Um, I try to use this more as a last resort, but we can also trial a different formula. So speaking about different formulas, we have the semi-elemental formulas. And these formulas have proteins that are broken down into peptide form for easier digestion. The fat is also primarily medium chain triglycerides instead of long chain fatty acids. 
Um, and I think, you know, while the, the peptides are usually the star of the show, they're usually the marketed feature of these formulas, the, the change of the fat source to that NCT, well, may be the real factor um, for better tolerance. Then we have elemental formulas, and these contain individual amino acids, and the formulas are very low in fat with the thought that minimal digestive function is required for these formulas. So you're not having as much stimulation of the exocrine pancreatic secretion. The considerations for using these semi-elemental or elemental formulas is one that they're expensive. So if you can find another underlying cause for any sort of diarrhea or constipation or nausea bombing, please do. If you're using an elemental formula long-term, we need to address the fat content because it is so low and we want to avoid essential fatty acid deficiency if this is going to be a long-term formula for them. If the patient is also eating by mouth, it's kind of hard to justify the need for an elemental or semi-elemental formula with these broken down proteins while they are eating intact proteins, say in meatloaf for lunch. Okay, so you're at the point that you've ruled out med medications, infectious etiology, you've tried different formulas and nothing is working for you. Know that there are still some additional steps you can take. Say the patient's super nauseous or they're very constipated. So if we are ever going to slow or stop the feeds, know that especially if they have a G-tube, we can open up that G-tube and vent it so we can decompress the stomach and that can really help with some symptoms, especially nausea. But if we're doing this, if we're slowing down the feeds or stopping them, we want to take precautions to prevent dehydration, especially in the home setting. Um, in the facility, we can do, run IV fluids, but in the home, we don't usually have those available. So we might want to consider an oral rehydration solution. And then if symptoms persist, we want to work with a provider to rule out other GI causes. So maybe it's inadequate symptom management. They only have PRN orders for antiemetics or a bowel regimen when they need more routine set orders. Maybe they have pancreatic insufficiency. Again, maybe what they have that um, SIBO, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Maybe they are flirting with irritable bowel syndrome, something like that, that we want to work with our provider to rule out. So that's all I have. I hope you found this information useful. Please leave a, a note in the comment section if you have any questions. We also have additional resources listed there. And subscribe to see more videos from DNS. Thanks. Mm -hmm.